Thanks, guys. So, well, th thanks to Seth for that performance. was absolutely beautiful. And thanks to David as well. Um, maybe we'll do the inverse of Seth, and I'll show you the goods. These are the goods, um, which is this patch that's it's an ongoing thing. It's called playthroughs. That whole idea of this was I started, um, I went to Berkeley, studied with um, Dr. Boulanger uh, in the early 90s, and I got started with Max there. Um, but sort of going back a little bit before that, I was a kid growing up in northern New Jersey, and I kind of discovered music entirely through records and going to record stores and that whole culture. And um, I think that background kind of forces you to play fast and loose with conventions in music. Um, you can listen to heavy metal or classical music or anything, and that's... As, and you think of music as a music listener first, before a composer or performer, you kind of become more aware of the breadth of possibility. So when I got to school, and I, and I was presented with the idea of computer music maybe for the first time, I mean, all my early experiments in electronic music were computers, sure, but, you know, um, things like Commodore 64s and the old Atari 800 and, and, you know, 128 and stuff like that, simple synthesis packages. Um, something like Max, even in the early 90s, seemed pretty limitless, and then as it progressed more through computers getting faster and MSP coming out and having more real-time possibilities, it really became very powerful. And by the time I got to school, yeah, 91 to 95, I got so deep into Max because it was, at the time, it just felt like it was something that you could really get away with doing a lot of real-time uh, things that were, it felt new and it felt fresh. And um, this patch came about because I wanted to make something like the classic minimalism Terry Riley time like accumulator system for just playing an unadorned instrument into a computer, just having audio go in. Nothing fancy, nothing about, you know, uh, MIDI tr tracking pitches or anything like that, just as simple as possible. And the, the, the root of it was this patch in the top left here, just the simple thing here, which is just. Um, um, I was using uh, the fiddle object uh, when, when Miller released it, and then I used Tristan Yehan's version of that, which was called Pitch for a while. And then I actually I started getting better results out of just using a plugin. And this is an important thing to talk about early on, is that there's this maybe feeling when you're developing Max patches that you have to do everything yourself. You kind of, I mean, it, it, to me, maybe this is a misconception early on, but it was about this feeling that I was somehow cheating by incorporating other people's designs early on, and I realized after a while that it was just the, whatever you, know, you use to get the best results is going to be the best solution. And I loved how just using this simple, cheesy um, pitch tracking plugin, which I think it's, it's, it's showing me in the list over here. Yeah, MDA Tracker. I'm using a monophonic pitch tracker, free VST, which the reason I love it is because it's wrong more than it's right. It kind of, you get these same kind of glitching um, kind of sounds that you get out of, like, say, like an octave pedal, like electroharmonics, I mean, that, that PLL classic kind of like two waves coming in trying to guess a pitch thing. Um, and the more I started to play around with it, it was getting comfortable just playing a normal electric guitar, just a signal right into a guitar processor into this patch. It started doing all these really cool things where it was guessing the pitch like eight octaves too high or too low, it was doing real ghost notes and harmonics, and it really added to the kind of like the, you know, it, become very, it became very perilous in an, a, early on in the patch. And, you know, because the whole thing is like the sound coming in this patch here, there's uh, eight delay heads that are tuned to kind of one, one side is all these Fibonacci sequence numbers or re relatives of that. One is like really closely, you know, the 10 milliseconds apart things going into, you know, two pairs of four tape heads, just like number arrays, there's different things. And every time I click on one of these buttons, it flashes those to eight like multi-tap objects. And then there's a master feedback. There's, I can control the wave that it's synthesizing, uh, what octave it's in, things like that. Um, so maybe, uh, let's see, probably the best way to do this is just to kind of go through one at a time and we'll show you how it is. Now this, this whole thing was, I had a very specific idea when I was building this patch and it wasn't really based on any one thing. Sure, this at Terry Riley kind of Adam, but the rest of it is so, it, how I chose to embellish it was so, I mean, just I was making choices as I was going along. So, so right off the bat, I'll play a sound right into the, the time, time like part of it. So this is just a sine wave. Okay, so there's a sine wave one octave above. There's master feedback. I'm using this Fibonacci sequence number, so you can kind of hear it. There are, there's a little bit of phase cancellation going in there. It's moving around a little bit in the stereo field. And it slowly dies away. We'll give it another note just to perpetuate it a bit more. 
same note. A little bit of weird tracking in there, so we're starting to get a little, it's been making this kind of cloud sound, but. These little glitches are kind of the effect I was going for. We'll give it an almost infinite feedback. So you can see once the, the signal came into the system, all these other things kind of sprang to life. So it's continuously recording into these, these two buffers over here, two banks of three buffers each, right? It's also, I have these turned off, but this is uh, another section that gets signal from the, uh, the input that's continuously recording. And this was, the idea of building this was mostly about just having a way, you know, I, I'm very comfortable with this mixer fader model of just controlling the entire patch from this to off the shelf innovation controller, just to have a way to, to kind of get comfortable with something. I and mean, this is as important to the, the performance as the guitar is, you know, to have a way to, to control and shape the different combinations of sounds. But really, I mean, it's just that input there. This is just playing back bi-directionally and there's you know, the, the regular speed down an octave, down two octaves switch on this side, kind of shuffling back and forth here, just doing classic sort of pitch, tape speed kind of things. Yeah. Put another sound in there, we can hear what it's doing. the sound going in. You can see a little, it's kind of just filling in the space between the notes. here. This is doing a really nice, very slow crawl. two on the top right here are basically I wrapped a front end around a pre-existing patch called Granular 2.5 designed by Nobuyasu Sakanda. And this is something I just saw, I discovered it existed, I took it, I kind of made it my own, you know, and that's one of the great things you can do within Max. You don't have to start from scratch. You can, you can build upon this entire library of great patches and just use them. And there's no guilt or shame in that. That's an important thing. And I wish I had, I had understood that early on when I was starting with this stuff, that you can take these things like tools and do beautiful things with them. And this is just really slowly crawling across and chewing through the sound and freezing it. And then each one is uh, 16 voices, 16 phases of the same sound slowly being spread out. And you can control each one chromatically this way. If I play something like a full chord through here. Okay, we'll play a nice big distorted guitar chord through here. Right. Just 
doing different pitches and different harmonics. So each one of the modules in this is designed to put something into it, and it's almost, think of each module like a member of an orchestra. And the conductor kind of looks at the orchestra and makes sure everybody's doing their job. But this is, um, each one is designed to be self-sustaining and kind of, I don't really need to think about what each one is doing atomically. I just want to be able to see it visually and just kind of know that this will keep playing this chord if I move on to the next one. So the whole thing is just this tiny patch running in this old Max 4 framework with these beautiful Ender's Doll GUI elements. Um, that just, it's, it's everything I need on one page. Um, and it's not overwhelming. It's kind of, it's because I, I, I got to build it over time, it's just, it's easy for me to see what's happening, and it's easy to have this little matrix thing route the, the sounds in and out of each module. Um, so maybe before I go too deep with any one thing, I'll just play it for 15 minutes, and then we'll, we'll talk. Um, maybe we'll have some questions about how it works. because it will clear out the buffer, here we go. Okay.
<laughs> right, so. Just, um, I mean, what's, what's cool about the, the, you know, the top left, the pitch tracker, is that you can really extend the range of just the guitar down way low and way high, and it was something that was very appealing early on, just to be able to play comfortably. Like, I grew up playing guitar, so the guitar just makes sense as a controller into all of this. You know, it was a way to kind of take something I'm familiar, I can just sort of play subconsciously without thinking about it, just what note choices are making, and then have this doing all the extension and all the orchestration and all those things, and, and being able to automate it without, yeah, like I said, like without having to individually massage each value as it's happening in each individual transform program, so. Um, but this entire thing is based on plugins, which are something that are, VST plugins mostly, that are so easily mappable and controllable within Max, and it was something that I had this like light bulb moment when I was like, oh, I don't have to roll my own pitch tracker, I don't have to roll my own granular shuffler, I don't have to do any of that stuff. If I just want to focus on the act of playing music, I can build this thing, and I thought, yeah, sure, it hinges on other people's ideas, but I can still use those in my own way. So that's the two that are moving around the top there, are just the classic GRM tools, you know. Shufflers from you know the, the early 2000s. These are four instances of the the same GRM uh, bandpass filter that are being, you know, I built Max front ends that kind of chew through and slide around spectrally. I don't think the cloud is still going, but yeah, they kind of they do this really nice four part kind of you know filtration. These things I built the sort of music concrete part of it that's doing the the, the pitch and things like that. And the granular, like I said, was Nobuyasu Sakanda. These are just plugins. That's a a delay, four tap delay, and that's a ebb and tide reverb. Some sound playback things here. But the whole thing is just, it's mappable one to one with what's going on in this controller here. You know, that's, I can just close the lid. I mean, I got to a point a few years ago where I could just play the entire patch from this. Um, and it depends on where you are with computers, I guess, and how much you want to have this GUI be the center of what you're thinking about when you play music. Or if you want to just shut your brain off to this idea of what's happening molecularly and just see it for a series of things, a series of eight parts that can be faded in and faded out, each with three controls that do something. Some core aspect of those eight things is controllable by these. And I can turn yeah, the recording of the individual things here on and off with buttons. But that's, I wanted it to be as simple as that, something I could play drunk, something I could play you know, without getting too lost in it. Um, and just thinking about what's happening musically more so than what's happening in the program itself. So yeah, this was, I started doing this in the late 90s, and I'm still revising it. Now the reason I'm not showing you the, the brand spanking new Max 8 version is because I'm still thinking about what needs to be done. You know, I'm thinking about what needs to be done within this to, to improve it, or to simplify it, or to turn it into something that's even maybe more subliminal. It has more, I'm delineating more control to it. Um, and those are, those are decisions that are ongoing, so. Um, when I built things from scratch now in Max, like I have a whole library of these great um, beat rearranging kind of things that I'm building in Max 8 that are maybe a bit too young to, to show you today. But um, yeah, but I, I like the fact that, well, this is maybe a good example of how you can build something. I'm sorry, building this in what, 99, 2000? And it still works beautifully on a contemporary computer today, and it's absolutely rock solid. Like I've never had this thing really crash or anything like that, even using all this third party stuff. Um, a lot of bonk objects in there doing the transient detection. There's a lot of, yeah, um, third party objects that are, I mean, once you install it and you get to learn it, that stuff works for ages, you know? I've had the same computer since 2012, and it's just, everything works beautifully. I've played this concert maybe, I don't know, two or 300 times, and I can really rely on it. And that's something that's very, uh, a testament to the power of Max itself, that it's so, it's so great as a solution. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything within this? Please. What are these 3D sliders? Uh, Anders Dahl GUIs. Now, I don't know if they've been updated to work with newer Macs, but I love them. They're really beautiful. Um, Max 4, so years. What, somebody, Mac scientist in the room, what year was Max 4.6? Nobody? 1914, yeah. So 1914, <laughs> Jefferson crossed the Delaware, and then, uh, yeah, he. No, these are, yeah, there was, back then, um, there was a lot of people doing this. Who is it? There still are. I mean, they're, I like them. They're, they're like these skeuomorphic 2.5D, you know, it's something very, you know. It's interesting to look at this thing now. I mean, there's a lot of these I probably put in this patch in the early 2000s, you know. Um, they're beautiful, aren't they? Even these, the, the matrix control with the green dots is Anders as well. Um, yeah. Anybody else? 
Yeah. It doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I love this thing. I really stuck by it. I wanted to find the, the most, the least masculine guitar I could play, and this was it. So, um, it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Like, like how I'm seeding the values into it. So it could be anything, right? Okay. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, and I'll, and I'll I'm not even point these at you like that. But um, this is the tuning is very bad on this thing. Um, the in intonation is very bad on it which is almost one of the reasons I chose it. It's not perfect. It's not an actual, like, you know, what is it, uh, logarithmic 12 to the octave value. It's not perfectly in phase and in sync. And the reason it's not, um, why I play this is because it's out of tune. You know, when I play an octave, it's not in tune. So you get all of those swarms of tiny little phase relationships that are happening within the, the pitch tracking and the way that it's being you know, put into the delay lines and all that, and all these magical things are happening with phase cancellation. If they were perfectly in tune and in phase, it would just sound like a standing wave. You know, it would just be like, it would be the math, just perfectly resolving. But because I'm using this and you know, it's doing a floating point pitch analysis on the modifying thing, it creates that, that subtle tuning inconsistencies create the music in this case. It creates what's interesting about it, all of that movement and all that interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I could, I could pull up a, you know, a caps lock keyboard and just play the note values on here, right, anybody could, but because I'm using this and because it's tracking it wrong and you're getting those ghosts in the machine, little sparkles and beautiful things, that's kind of like, in my mind, is the interesting stuff, you know, the, the notes themselves are part of it, but the, uh, when it gets it wrong, that you can actually, at this day and age, have a ghost in the machine kind of situation running, it's, it's really, um, it's appealing and I think it's like really a core part of the piece itself, so to answer your question. <laughs> Anybody else? Please. Mm. Yeah, it's just a matter of wanting to have a certain level of complexity, you know, like just thinking orchestrally, just thinking, you know, this, this, should be a frozen granular chord, but it can't just be playing at full volume. It has to, something, you know, spectrally, would be nice if something was moving. There's a lot of movement within the patch, so none of this is synchronized. There's no clock, there's no master, anything. Everything is happening, like even all the things that are scanning through that sort of concrete buffer thing in the middle and the things that are scanning through the bandpass are just totally unsynchronized, mostly line objects that are just gradually going from this floating point value to this one over two minutes, over three minutes, you know, and going there and back. Um, a lot of those number boxes up there, where's my pointer? Um, oh. A lot of these up here are just, that's how long, how many seconds it takes for this to go from that value to that value. So it takes 40 seconds. This one here is 67 to go from that value to that value with that bandwidth. And it's also, all of these are controlling line objects. That's the, the floating point value from zero to one. This is how much time I turned it on, so the animation is on for that value, the center frequency of that bandpass filter. Uh, set and forget, you know, in a way where it's just it can move freely, you know. And if I hear something that's, you know, it's almost like you don't notice it until it's doing something outside of the range that you want, and then I still have this control over here to manually fade it up and bring it down, you know. All the time when I'm playing this thing, it gets lost, and a sound comes out that I have no idea where it's coming from. Especially when I'm doing a lot of the same tonality, the same kind of chords, whatever there'll suddenly be this, like I forgot to disable record on something and then suddenly it's just cutting in and out. But I love that, I love that about it. So um, everything in here, all of this is, yeah, so that's controlling, uh, you know, uh, every 58, well, actually the tempo is random, full range, randomly controlling how much randomness is going to the period of the shuffling, you know, and then um, all of these, are, yeah, there's so much randomness in here, it's endless. Couple dozen of individual timing engines that are doing individual things. Um, but the whole thing with the sliders and the whole thing with having it like this is that it's, you can really dial in particular ranges that make musical sense. So that's part of why I do it this way. But I love that. I love that it's a lot of personalities, a lot of individual things are working. You know, they're working algorithmically, but they're, you can set the range in a way. So you can kind of play God with it, you know? <laughs> like you can set, but it's just in here, you know, a little bit, and move around a little bit, and that's it. Okay, anybody else? Please. Yeah, there's a lot of, it, within the line objects, I'm doing a little bit with slew. It's mostly linear, it goes here. Maybe it's a sinusoidal, kind of, it goes slowly to the end and comes back, you know. Um, yeah. This, well, this is also like light and for presentation mode. Exactly, right, right. This is, this is command E to unlock it. This is way back in the, you know, the, the, the salad days, as we call it, yeah, yeah. 
What's that? They're all B patches. Yeah, here, I'll unlock it here. I'll show you. Command E. Yeah. So, yeah, this was, yeah, there you go. Now, do I still make patches from scratch like this? No, of course not. I use the contemporary stuff. The contemporary stuff is great. Max 8 is amazing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Um, this, um, do I need to update it? No. You know, it's, it does exactly what I do. Are there new things that I'd like to incorporate in here from Max 8? Of course. There's a million things that I'd love to put in here. But um, as a thing that takes that much screen real estate up and does exactly those things, it's really, I like it. And I, I don't feel compelled to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. I, I build new things instead of constantly reinventing this. Um, I, mostly these days I play with a modular synthesizer that I'm feeding sounds for Max um, via one of those expert sleepers modules, you know, that just gives it four channels of audio and then four channels of like bonk interpreting transients within the audio itself that's, you know, triggering things within the synthesizer. And that's like the ultimate set and forget thing because I, it's just like Seth was saying, I launch it up, it picks four random sounds, I almost can just close the lid at that point and play the, the sounds within the synthesizer just using the, um, the transients that Max is finding. So that's, you know, uh, th that stuff I'll build from scratch in newer versions of Max. But, yeah, this one was just sort of my, the thing that I used for the longest. I mean, we're talking 20 years of playing this. I mean, I put out a record of this music in 2002, and I was already doing it for a few years at that point. And, um, yeah, it's just, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with what it does. And I'm happy with the fact that once you spend enough time with any instrument, you, it becomes like a, you know, it becomes comfortable and easy. So I don't have to think about it too much. Um, I can just play and think about what I want to accomplish and just get into it that way. So it's become more of like a standalone instrument than a, a thing that I want to constantly revise. So anyone else? Yeah. I'm kind of curious because you say you play this, play this so many times. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you sit down, are you kind of an open book, like I'm going to roll the dice? And exactly. Or is, yeah, yeah. Or, or is it intentional to over that? Time? It depends on context. I mean, I don't always play to. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of an enfant to read with this stuff, but I, if I get booked to play somewhere that has a context, like, say, at a dance music festival, um, I will play the most, you know, non-functional thing with this. Because you can still do rhythms and things with the granular and shuffling and all that. Um, if I get booked to play in an art space, I always play really loud. If I get booked in a heavy metal club, I always play quietly. You know, it's kind of, it's pretty malleable, you know? Because, I mean, it's just, it's a guitar, and then this open book of things that you can do with guitar sounds, you know? I don't always have to use that heavy... Marshall stack kind of sound. Oftentimes, I just use the sine waves, and it just it stays very primary and just you know you simple do you have in that a, way. A set of like uh, kind of frequency uh, motifs of kind of developed. Absolutely. Time. Yeah, yeah. I, I I stick to those kind of open pentatonic kind of things just because there's going to be so much um, spectral movement that I kind of keep the intervals clear. But I also do. I all, often when I play it for a long time, I'll build a gigantic chord and then add the extra note that'll reframe it as another tonality and then build that tonality up and just do that every 10 minutes, kind of slowly reframe it this way. But that's just what I like doing, you know. Um, but yeah, but there's, no, there's almost no preconceived notions. This is, that's why I think of it more of an instrument than anything else. I mean, you sit at a piano, you can play Rachmaninoff or you can play Satie. It's like, you know, there's all of these fine gradations in between. So um, it's good to be able to realize those things with one solution, so. Uh -huh. Anyone else? Please. What was your, uh, Terry Riley, my time lag accumulator, a Persian surgery dervishes, absolutely. Like that whole like one instrument playing through a tape machine with the sound on sound mode, you know. Um, I heard that record when I was really young, it was crucial for me. So um, classic, if you, if you haven't heard it, it's classic minimalism. He's playing organ, um, it's kind of sitting on the floor surrounded by tape machines, and each one is a cyclical loop of sustained sound, and he's overdubbing it to it. So that's, I mean, I actually called that patch up there, the time lag, you know, it basically does the same thing. Um, there's a lot going on in the background. This is just the front end of it. You know, there's a lot of these things that are happening in the background that I don't need to see. You know, they're just there to, that's to remind me what it's doing. And if I click on any of those boxes, it just flashes all those delay times to the 16 taps. I think 16 right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, yeah, this is a great conversa full conversation that we can have. Um, and privately, um, you know, in, in length, but shortly, I think it's um, early on, I got the feeling that, let's say, like this Nobuyasu Sakanda granular patch, it was definitely it was a building block more than it was a, an instrument at that point. It was a series 
of patches for making this really elegant granular that was windowing and doing all these really nice elegant things to avoid the sort of traditional clicky kind of, you know, rectangle window granular. And I struggled to build it myself. You know, I tried. You know, I sat there for a couple months and I tried to build a really elegant granular patch. Um, studying at the feet of the masters, you know, in this case. I, I saw this patch, it was perfect. And did I wholesale crib the entire thing and put it in there? No, of course. I took it, I assessed it atomically, and then took the bits that made sense and, you know, installed them. That patch particularly, I don't know where you can even find it these days. I don't know if there's a repository of his patches, but um, uh, it was designed to have, you know, you can have infinite phases of the, of the you know, the, the, this one buffer, you know. So I think the original patch that he put out was eight phases. I have something like 128 total or something in here. I forget what I actually did in the end. But um, as computers got faster, I could add more voices. So it was kind of a neat thing. You could scale it. You know, it was a kind of a cool idea. He designed it from the ground up to be scalable. So that's probably why I still use it. You know, <laughs> I would have either rolled my own or, or by this point, I mean, in Jesus in 20 years, it's, you know. Um, but um, yeah, um, I, I talk about it openly. I think that's the, really the best way to do it. You know, when you take someone else's idea and you incorporate it into something you're working on, of course, you know. Influence is a, is a crucial part of this, you know. None of this is born of nothing. I mean, it, it, there's all some level of inspiration there, you know. Um, do I own this patch? No. I mean, it's just, it's a thing that I built. It's based from preconceived ideas, you know, so. Yeah, but that is, a, I'd love to have that conversation <laughs> in, in more detail, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I think we're good. Um, well, thanks, guys.